Day to day in Jesus' precious name. You can find my scriptures. Okay. Point number one. God called Deborah, not her husband. So God called Deborah, but not her husband. In the book of Judges, chapter 4, verse 3 to verse 5, Judges, chapter 4, verse 3 to verse 5, let me read it for you. Judges, chapter 4. Okay, so Judges chapter 4, verse 3 to verse 5. The Bible says, And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Remember the theme of this month is you have come into the kingdom for such a time like this. So we want to see practical examples where God spoke to individuals and how they acted on the word of God how they kept the charge of the Lord and how they obeyed the command of the Lord and what was uh, the result. So here, the children of Israel, they were oppressed and they cried out unto the Lord. For Jabin had 900 chariots of iron and uh, for 20 years, they, uh, he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. So the people around you might be oppressed by uh, Jabin, which were, who was the king of uh, the Midianite, and uh, his commander was a Sisera. He oppressed the people of the Lord for so long. But God is not going to come down from heaven to deliver. Even when God said to Moses, I've heard in the Exodus chapter 4, I heard the cry of my people. So I have come down to deliver them. Well, God is spirit. He needs a body. We always need to understand that God is spirit. He needs a body. So though he said to Moses, I have come down to deliver them. And he said to Moses, Moses, I want to send you to Pharaoh. But God does not just send the men. God also sends women because man and the woman were created in the image of God. The fact that you're a woman is not because you have a womb. That's not the truth. The word woman comes from Ishi, means from the same spirit. Ish is a man. And Ishi is uh, the woman from the spirit. So the same spirit that was in Adam is the same spirit that is in the woman. When God created mankind, he created them male and the female in his own image and after his own likeness. So if you volunteer to be used by God, God is going to use you regardless of uh, your gender your age, your complexion, God is going to use you. So there was an oppression for 20 good years and the people cried out unto the Lord. And the Bible says, Thou Deborah, a prophetess, listen, Deborah, the prophetess. So it means that there are pastors who are female. There are apostles who are females. There are evangelists who are females. There are teachers of the law who are females and what is of this that we need. There are deaconesses. Anything that the man can do for God, the woman also can do it for God. And Deborah was a prophetess. She was not a single woman. She was a married woman. They say, now Deborah, a prophetess, 
the wife of Lapido, a husband who was not dead, he was still alive, and the husband's name was Lapido, who judged, so was judging Israel at that time. So she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah. David named the palm tree after a name, Deborah. And she would sit under that palm tree between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. The whole nation, just like the whole nation was going to see Eli for judgment, the, the whole nation. All those 12 tribes were going to Deborah, the prophetess, so that she can judge. So when Deborah was the judge of Israel, just like Gideon was the judge of Israel, just like Jephthah was the judge of Israel. That is the highest title that God could give to a person before he gave them kings, because before they did not have a king, so God gave them churches to administer on the behalf of God. So if God could make a woman to occupy such a high position, why do you limit yourself? Because of your gender. It has always been men that have tried to limit the women. God does not uh, limit uh, women in the name of uh, Jesus. Now, women are allowed to share in the same inheritance uh, that men also are sharing in. Now, in the book of uh, Numbers, the book of Numbers, Sorry, before I say that, I'll say something that most of the time it is men, the male, that uh, try to limit or cap the promotion of uh, women because of the traditions of uh, men. Mark chapter 7, verse 13, the Bible says, uh, We made the word of God of a knowing, make the full our tradition that we handed down from generation to generation. So, the traditions of men. Even when you read the Bible, there are Jewish traditions. And unfortunately, the Gentiles, we are the Gentiles and not the Jews. When we preach the gospel, we want to, because we don't know how to rightly divide the word of God, we want to impose the Jewish tradition on the Gentiles, uh, people. That's what Paul was trying to do in the beginning. And after that, he died to the Jewish tradition. But we are also preaching the gospel. Sometimes we want to make good Americans out of all the Christians. So we are also trying to export our culture. Good English out of all the Christians that we win. Good Congolese or Nigerian, whatever your, your nationality is. We need to learn to remove our traditions and only preach the pure word of God. So that's what we try to do. It is hard. Paul said he had to die daily to those traditions. So I said to you that women were allowed to share in the inheritance with the male. In the book of Numbers, chapter 27, the book of Numbers, chapter 27, you can read it from verse 1 to verse 11. Okay? So the Bible says, uh, Then came the daughters of Zelo uh, Fehad. Zelo Fehad was uh, the son of uh, Hefer, the son of uh, Gilead, the son of Akir, the son of uh, Manasseh. So one of the songs or great grandsons of Manasseh, he did not have he did not have sons. He only gave birth to daughters. <laughs> so the first one he was looking for a male. The first one came a female. The second one a female. The third one a female. The fourth, the sixth, the seventh. He had seven daughters, no son. 
Now, according to the tradition of the Jews, I told you the tradition of men have made the word of God of no effect. So according to the traditions of uh, men, they refused to give them an inheritance. But those women, they were clever. They said, that's not right. That's why you need to question the man of God. I was waiting for you downstairs, and then I waited, waited, and I came upstairs. <laughs> Welcome up. Yes, thank you. So, very good man. Thank you. I will be seeing. <laughs> Any word, you are more than welcome. So, the traditions of men made the word of God of no effect. And many times in your place of work, you were che cheated because you don't confront the leadership. You need to learn to confront the leadership in your place of work. You need to learn to confront the leadership in the church. Nicely, you don't need to be rude. But you need to confront the leadership. Today we almost worship the man of God, which is not according to the Bible. Imagine Moses with all those signs and wonders. He parted the Red Sea, destroyed Egypt. Here are seven women calling Moses. We think that what you are teaching is not right. How come? Because our father did not have sons. You mean that we are not going to have an inheritance? He said, that's not the truth. Go talk to God again. You did not hear properly. So Moses was the weakest man on the face of the earth. Thank God, you need to be humble to take even correction from the people that you are teaching the word of God. God resists the proud that we saw yesterday. He gives grace to the humble. So Moses said, maybe I got it wrong. Let me go because that's all it has always been like that since the day of Father Abraham in the land of uh, Ur of the Chaldees in Syria. Don't just never get anything. So Moses went back on the mount to talk to God. And he said to God, God, this is the problem. Zelophehad had, had daughters, and they are complaining that they need an inheritance like the brethren. Should we give them an inheritance? Then the Lord spoke to Moses. Hallelujah. The Lord spoke to Moses. He said to God, so, okay. So, not, in verse 4 to verse 11 of that Numbers 28, you can read the whole Numbers 27, sorry. But I want to read it. I will paraphrase it. So, the daughters of um, the Zelophehad said, why would the name of our father be removed from among his family because he had no sons? So give us the possession among our father's brothers. Verse 5. So Moses brought the case before the Lord. Verse 6. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad speak what is right. Mm -hmm. So Moses, all along you were wrong. So for 120 years of your existence, you were wrong. For more than 500 years, since uh, they, they spent the four, 430 years in slavery. So for more than 500 years, you mean that we were wrong? Yes. There are many things. God will not tell you unless you ask. You need to ask. So he said, the daughter were right. You should give them an inheritance among the brethren. So Moses came down and gave the word of the Lord. And God said, we were wrong all those centuries. And it was never the will of God to bully women that they will have nothing at all. They would occupy no position of leadership. In fact, God was even helping them so that they can see that God does not think that way on the traditions of man. Now, the people agreed. Okay, Moses, God spoke. God spoke, and that's true. But now we go in Numbers chapter 36, verse 2 
to verse 8. Numbers chapter 36 now, verse 2 to verse 8. I'm going to paraphrase, but you write it down. So the male in the congregation, they say, you know, God said that we should give them an inheritance. No problem. But if they receive an inheritance, they are going to marry someone else. And then when they marry, the plot of the land that they give them is going to go and be added to the other tribe. So now let us impose on those women that they should only marry in our tribe. They should only marry their cousins. That's how people started to marry cousins. It's because of inheritance. So you see why in many cold countries, people only marry the same village, the same uh, uh, family, because they don't want to lose uh, the land. If we have to give the land to women, then they should only marry now in our family. So those seven women, they were single. They said, why? We've been praying for marriage. Here is a free marriage. Why not? So they agreed. There are many things that God will not say to you. He will ask your opinion. Sometimes it's complicated with marriage. God will say to those women, do you want to be married to those cousins of yours? They say, yes. We've been praying for marriage. Why not marry our cousin? So God said, okay, no problem. So that's how men added again at the cultures to impose women that though they give them lands, but they should not marry outside of uh, the clan. The traditions of men are making the word of God of no effect. That's also what happens in church. Sometimes God gives the word of God. It is clear. But the vessel that God is using is a polluted. So the word of God is going to come with some uh, culture of uh, that man of God, with some tradition of that man or woman of God, with some flavor. It is hard. We need to die to self so that we can deliver the word of God freely to the people and uh, in the, as a pure as the Lord spoke. God said, give them an inheritance. They can marry anyhow. And not always in the, you need to marry someone who is born again under Israel. And the people say, no, only marry in our clan. The book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 30. After the apostles, chapter 17, verse 30. Paul is explaining to each one of us. Truly, these times of ignorance, God overlooked. Uh, but now, commands all men and women everywhere to repent or to think differently. Metanoia. The King James says, truly, the times of ignorance, God winked. So God, many times he winked. That thing, he winked. He saw something was wrong. And because it was not something that was leading people to hell, he winked. He said, I would overlook it. I overlook a lot of things. When I discovered that God overlooked a lot of things, I started to overlook a lot of uh, things, just like God does. He sees something is wrong, but as long as you don't object, he said, okay. The head covering of women, it is actually a Jewish tradition. As long as you don't object to it, God says, that's okay. But now, when the church of Corinth will, will say, that's not our culture to be wearing scarves on our heads, then Paul had to back off. He said, the church of God also does not have such culture. So if it is not your culture to be covering your head and so on and so forth, you don't need to do so. So there are many things that in some parts of the world, Women will sit on the left and men will sit there on the right side. And they are Christians. You go to India, that's how it is going to be. So when we get there, we know that that's not what God wants. 
And as long as the women don't object, we continue to do. We don't try to change things. You go to some churches. When you get there, you need to remove your shoes. I will say to them, can I keep my socks? <laughs> so, <laughs> if I can keep my socks, okay, I will remove. Because this is the holy ground. Well, so I will remove my, my shoe, but I will keep my socks. So now I started to wear good socks. I don't have clothes in there. <laughs> so I made sure that all my socks are clean because I don't know where I'm going and what kind of tradition they have in that church. So God winks at many things. And you need to learn also to overlook many things. As long as it is not the sinful. You overlook it in the mighty name of Jesus. It's basically how you think in your heart. I will tell you a small story. I was living in a shared accommodation in Manchester. There was um, one someone from uh, Malawi, uh, someone from Italy, someone from America. There was a, a English guy who was a LGBTQ and T and all those uh, letters, and uh, there was myself. I was the only Christian in that hall, in that shared house. You need to make up your mind that you are going to live by Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Whatsoever is a true, or service is a key word, or service is a praise of word, you are going to meditate only on those things, no matter what. So, I was, uh, that my, my, my bedroom was downstairs, so I was praying and uh, doing things, worshiping the Lord, and the Lord said to me, go upstairs. So I went upstairs, and when I went upstairs, the, the door of the, of the bathroom was open, and I saw my flatmate. I, I don't know if it was intentional or unintentional. He dropped my toothbrush in the toilet. My toothbrush turned into the toilet. So he did not know I was behind him. So he took it out, he shook, shook it, and he put it back. <laughs> So when he turned, he saw me, he turned red. He thought I would be, I just smiled. I said, hello. He came out of the bathroom, so I entered. So the devil was not saying to, to him that this is how he has been doing every day. He would put your. <laughs> you can choose to believe what is negative about people, or you can choose to believe what is positive. So I chose to believe. That it was an accident. Hallelujah. <laughs> you choose to believe. And depending on how you choose to believe, you are going to have a peace that day or be filled with anger and uh, hatred. You choose how your day is going to be. So we have uh, to overlook many, many, many things. Whether it was deliberate, or it was an accident, you choose only to believe what is positive about the people. So when the people kick the flyers or do whatever, you choose to believe it was not deliberate. So that you can go and sleep. You don't have time to carry that junk in your heart. Choose to believe what is positive about people and overlook so many things like God does. He winks to the days of our ignorance because they are only ignorant. That's not how we are supposed to behave. So in the days of our ignorance, Psalms, uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 13, God winked. He said, I will correct it later. But now, I really don't have time for that nonsense. So choose to be a man of peace. Point number two. Point number two. Arise as a mother in the land. Arise 
as a mother in the land. In the book of Judges, chapter 5, verse 6 and verse 7, Judges chapter 5, verse 6 and verse 7, the Bible says, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Shaed. So it was not just the Deborah that arose, but the young daughter also Shaed. That angel also arose. So the Bible says that the highways were deserted because they were oppressed, so nobody was even venturing in the streets. And the travelers walked along the byways. The village life ceased. It ceased in Israel. But until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in the land. You need to arise as a mother in the land to start praying for your daughters, inspiring your sons and inspiring your daughters. Your sons and your daughters are going to imitate you and they are going to be mighty men and mighty women of valor. Deborah, when she rose as a mother, as a prophetess, they saw a woman in the position of leadership. They took her as an example. So, your sons and your daughters are going to look up to you as an example. So, we see, for instance, she has inspired Barak. The Bible says in Judges chapter 4, verse 6 to verse 9. Judges chapter 4, verse 6 to verse 9. The Bible says, Then Deborah sent and called for Barak. And the son of Abimor from Kedesh in Naphtali and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor? Take with you 10,000 men, the sons of Naphtali and of the sons of Zebulon. And against you, I will deploy Sisera, the commander. Um, Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon. And I will deliver him into your hand. Verse 8. And Barak, the young man, said to Deborah, the mother in the land, If you would go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not. Uh, Go. Some of our young men. Here was the young man Barak. Do you know a Kenyan author that is called Barak? Hussein Obama? He was looking down on himself. Here I am only a, a, a little Kenyan. I don't have my father. My father abandoned me. Your name is Barak. Arise. He was brought up by his mother and grandmother. Look at what the Lord did at the life of Barak. He became a giant in the land where he was. You are going to become a giant in the land. And many times we are afraid based on our upbringing, our shortcomings. But when you have God in your life, you don't have any shortcoming. God is a what makes the difference in your life. Regardless of uh, the path that were dealt with, that you were dealt with when you were born, whether there was a father or no father, Barack Obama, the father, left, went back to Kenya. But the mother, the grandmother brought him up and he came great. So sometimes our children, they are also afraid. You need to lead by example. You need to speak life into them, encourage them, and do things with them. They will copy literally everything that you do. My mom used to bring the work at home, and she would sit and be doing the work. Why? She cannot be asking us to be doing our homework if we are not seeing her doing also some work. 
So on purpose, you bring some work, some fire from the office, and we working them in the living room. And we also we sit around the dinner table, we have our books, and we doing our primary school home work. You need to encourage the barats. They will follow by example. You need to speak greatness into them. Don't speak words that are going to kill the confidence. My mother did not need English. Well, I did it English. So I cast the vision. I saw a vision that I was in a country that only speaks English. I thought it was only the US that spoke English. So for me, I was going to the US. So I was how old was I? I was eight, no, nine. When I knew I was not going to live in a French speaking country. So I cast the vision with my mother. She said, then you need to start learning English. So she registered me with the employees of the railway company where she was working because they were doing English classes. So I was, here I was 10 years old, sitting with fathers that were 40s and above, learning English with them. In Africa, you can do lots of things that you cannot do here in Europe. Because my mom saw that this is the wish that I have cast. My mom also saw that we wanted to go far in our studies. So she sat us down. She said, you will need, for what you want to do, you will need some mathematics, you will need some physics, some chemistry. So we had to have tutors. So three times a week, we would have a tutor that would come to teach us maths, to teach us physics, and to teach us chemistry. Not that we were failing in school, no. And because she wanted us to go far. When she would go to Italy, she would bring me a CD of the curriculum of Italy. When she would go to, to Switzerland, she would bring me the CDs of what they are studying for my class. She would go to France, she would bring me the CDs. So when I was at home, I was not studying based on combo. Because I knew I would be competing with all the people from all over the world. So combo was never in my equation. You train your children based on the vision that they have. So get the tutors for them in the name of Jesus. Even when they are already doing good, get the tutors for them because you have another vision for your children. Inspire them in the name of Jesus. Even for preaching the word of God, you don't just wake up one morning and you open your Bible and you become a pastor. No! You need to study to show yourself approved of God. So, depending on where God is taking you, the kind of platform that God is going to give you, there must be a depth of the word of God in you. Otherwise, people are not going to be able to receive you. They are going to teach them rubbish. So, arise. So, she inspired Barak to go and conquer the land in the name of Jesus. But she also inspired Jael. In the book of Judges chapter 5 from verse 24 to verse 27, Judges chapter 5 from verse 24 to verse 27, the Bible says, most blessed among the women is Jael, the wife of Eber the Kenite. Blessed is she among the women in tents. So I'm going to paraphrase it. Sisera was running for his life and he hid. He, he arrived in the compound of Shael. Shael said to her, to him, please come into my tent. She lured him into his tent, into her tent. She entered, he entered, she gave him milk, some cheese. The guy ate and started to snore. And she took a tent peg and a hammer, and she drove that tent peg through the temple, and he died there. He was a mighty general killed by a woman. She was inspired when she saw that Deborah rose and was leading the troops of Barak. The eye also came fight. 
Who told you women cannot fight? Everything a man can do, a woman can do. And God wants you to inspire your sons, your daughters, that they are going to be great in the land. They are destined for greatness. Point number three, because time will always fail me. Point number three. The Bible says that you need to know your worth. Point number three, you need to know your worth. The Bible tells us in Psalm 139, verse 14, Psalm 139, verse 14, you need to know it because I quote it all the time. I'm going too quick. Okay. Psalm 139, verse 14. Hallelujah. Help me, Jesus. The Bible says, I will praise the Lord. Why? For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are the works, and my soul knows very well. You need to know very well that you are fearfully. And wonderfully made. My sister, that's why I say all the sisters are fearfully and wonderfully made. You need to know it. Many are ignorant. That's why when a man says to you, you are ugly, you are depressed. Who told you you were? Your father in heaven says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Ignore that foolish man. He does not know your value, how much you are worth. The Bible says, so from this day forward, you need to know Psalm 139, verse 14. I, whenever I looked at myself in the mirror, I said, Jerry, you are beautifully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are the works of God's hand. And I, Jerry, I know it very well. So I would place it under my chair as I'm beautifully and wonderfully made in the name. And why do I do that? Because growing up in my culture, if you want a child to study and not be Chasing after women, you need to tell him that he's ugly. Because if he knows he's handsome, he'll be now chasing after women. So my mom used to insult me that you are ugly, that your head is so big. She was only never whenever she would insult me, she would insult me now upon the top. I won't say it, but basically she would insult me. <laughs> she would insult me now upon the top, but now I grow with that image. That my head is not big. You know the the uh, palm knots. They have a cluster. So my head is as big as the cluster of the palm knot. So it truly damaged my self image. Until I was eighteen, I did not know I was handsome. And then I came to to France, and it was a like, you are handsome. I said, No, this is because you. Well, for you, all the blacks are handsome. I know I am ugly. And then I started telling my mother to say that I'm handsome. I said, but mom, for all those 18 years, you said that I was, my head was as big as the cluster of uh, uh, palm nuts. Now you are saying that I'm handsome. And those words surely destroyed my self-image. Words are worse than even a knife. So that's why when I look at myself in the mirror, I say, Jerry, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous how we face. Hallelujah. Marvelous are the works of God's hand. I was, my confidence was so destroyed that when I was working the hard, my feet were like that. And I have big feet. That's why I always ordered my shoes. So my mom also would be insulted to my feet. So uh, that my feet are like uh, the, you know those sweepers, those palms. So, yeah, so my feet are as big as those feet. So I look at my feet. I say, oh God, please, can I have shorter feet? <laughs> and then the children at school, they will look at my height. They will be singing a song in primary school, they are very lean. They will be singing a song, now on the tongue, that you are too old to be primary school. <laughs> so they will be singing. You are too old to be in primary school. You are too old to be in primary school. So, in primary school, you would go with shorts. So, when I would go to primary school, I would put my trousers right in the street. Nobody would know that I'm in primary school. 
If I have to arrive now in public school, I will remove my trousers and go to class. I was so happy when I got out of primary school. I used to pray to God, God, why did you make me tall? Oh God, can you remove at least half a meter from my hand? That was my prayer. And I prayed and prayed till I was 25. So you see, now when I look at the mirror, I said, Jerry, you are beautifully, mom, your mom was wrong. You are beautifully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are the works of God's hand. God does not make a mistake. You need to know your value, how much you are worth to God. The way God sees you, God sees you as a pearl. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 45 to verse 46, that parable you need to know it in your heart. Matthew, chapter 13, verse 45 to verse 46. The Bible says, The kingdom of heaven. Is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. So you are a beautiful pearl. The funny thing about pearls is that you have white pearls, you have black pearls, you have yellow pearls, you have brown pearls, you have pink pearls. All the complexion of the planet Earth are represented in the pearls. So God sees you as a pearl. The reason why God used the pearls here, because in the days, the pearls were rare and very expensive. There was no gemstone. Diamond, gold was not as expensive as a pearl. Even a hundred years ago, in the beginning of the 1900, a whole skyscraper in New York was sold for the price of a pearl necklace. That's how pearls were very expensive. Imagine the trade, the trade center, the World Trade Center building, that, that structure sold at the price. At, they just exchanged the pearl, the necklace and pearl. That's how they were worth millions, even billions of our money today. Just a necklace of a pearl. That's how they were, that's what Jesus used example of uh, pearl. But today, pearls are mass produced and they are worth uh, nothing. Now, diamond is more expensive. That's why also when you read the book of uh, Proverbs, they are talking about the ruby because ruby was more expensive than uh, diamond. So when you read the Bible, already do that understanding. So, what's, you are priceless. Nobody can buy you. So stop cheapening yourself. See yourself as a pearl. Of great value that someone to marry you, he has to sell everything. That's what Jesus said. He, he sold everything in heaven to come down so that you can become his bride. So, who is that foolish man that is looking down on you, insulting you, abusing you, and you are taking those insults? You simply don't know your wife. The Bible says. Is seeking the beauty for pearls. Who, when he had found one, not two, when he has found his pearl, hallelujah. What he does is that uh, at great price, he went and sold all that he can buy that pearl. The reason why some of some women they would allow to just come and live with a man without that one marrying them is because they don't know. The value. The reason why we sometimes we ac accept that we be pregnant without being married because we don't know our value. If we don't know our value, we are going to cast our pearl before swine. Now Jesus tells us in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Matthew 7, verse 6. Hallelujah. He says, Do not give what is the holy. The dogs, hallelujah. No cast your pearls before swine. Some men are pigs. So if you see a man is a pig, don't cast your you are a pearl. Don't cast your pearl among pigs. Know your value. Let that man do the right thing. Let him treat you like a princess angel. So when you are walking angel, see yourself as a princess. 
Because you are Israel and friends with God. Why Joshua, you are walking, see yourself as a prince. Praise the Joshua, because you are Israel. Praise me. When I had that revelation that I was a prince, oh, my attitude changed. I was walking like a lion. No, I was on foot. I was walking like a lion. Hallelujah. Because I knew who I was now in Christ. I will not cast my pearl among the pigs. They don't know my value. So what would they do? They will trample you under the feet and they will tear you into pieces. They don't know how much you are worth. Today, I want you to arise like Deborah in the land. Today, if you are the Barak, I want you to arise to your destiny because you have a great destiny. Today, if you are the Jael, I want you to arise because you also have a great destiny. So you, the mothers, I want you to inspire the Deborahs. I want you to inspire you to the, the barracks, and I want you to inspire the Jair, the young ones. Because greatness is in the seed. That seed is already in them, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We want to give you all the glory. We want to give you all the praise. Thank you for this Mother's Day. Thank you because... Uh, there was no more life. Life ceased in Israel. Life had ceased in Glasgow, in the UK, until Deborah arose. Until a woman called Deborah arose in the land. And she led the Barats, the young ones. She led the Jael to greatness, to fulfill the destiny. And I see greatness in all of our children. I see greatness in each one of us. We are pearls of great value. We will stop. Casting our pearl before swines, they don't know how much we are worth. They don't see us the way God sees us. You see only greatness in us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are the works of our, of your hand, my soul. From this day forward, I choose to know it and believe it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. Let us share the grace before we eat the cake. I see the cake there. It's worth a distraction. Let us share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. And surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. So, Happy Mother's Day, and they brought a cake for you to celebrate Mother's Day. So have a slice of that cake in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I don't know what is happening with that cake, but may God bless you if you could follow us until now. And I will see you on Monday in Jesus' precious name. Bye bye. Thank you. Tea, coffee, and especially the cake.